So it is an honor and pleasure to welcome Professor Maria Conchetta Morone to our BIU Vision Science Seminar. Professor Morone graduated in physics from the University of Pisa and then trained in biophysics at the Elite Scuola Normale Superiore. Following research positions at the University of Western Australia, the Scuola Normal Superior and the CNR Institute of Neuroscience in Pisa, she was appointed Professor of Psychophysiology in the Faculty of Psychology at the University uh, Università uh, Vita Salute San Rafael in Milan and is now a Professor of Physiology in the School of Medicine of the University of Pisa. She is the Director of the Vision uh, Laboratory of the IRCCS Fondazione Stella Maris and Academic Director of the Inter-University Masters in Neuroscience. From an initial interest in biophysics and physiology, where she made many seminal contributions, she moved on to psychophysics and visual perception. Over the years, her research has spanned spatial vision, brain development, brain plasticity, attention, color, motion, robotics, vision during eye movements, and more recently, multisensory perception and action. Her research involves the study of both humans and animals using a variety of techniques, including psychophysics, electrophysiology, functional brain imaging, computational modeling, and artificial intelligence. She is an expert of functional imaging of the human brain, both in EEG and MR techniques, as well as brain damage and brain plasticity in children and adults and including developmental and neonatal brain disorders, particularly, particularly from, for the sensory and motor systems. In collaboration with MR Group of a Fondazione Stella Maris, she, uh, her, research, her recent venture has been to obtain funding for and set up full functionality of a new ultra high field 70 MR scanner in Pisa. She was elected a member of the Academia de Lince, I think, I, I hope I said that right, and has been awarded major national and international prizes for scientific achievements, including the 2019 Ken Nakayama Medal for Excellence in Visual Science. She has coordinated many European community grants over many funding schemes and was awarded uh, for example, the ERC IDEA Advanced Grant for Excellence in Science. She has been a senior member of two other ERC Advanced Grants. Professor Morone has published over 20, um, 220 publications in excellent in international peer-reviewed journals, including Nature, Neuron, Current Biology, eLife, and Trends in Neuroscience. She has over 17,000 citations and an age index of 68, according to Google Scholar. During the course of her career, she has established three new labs in Perth, Pisa, and Milan, all with state-of-the-art technology and is still active and productive. She is and has been in multiple editorial roles in multiplicity of scientific peer-reviewed journals, including Journal of Vision, Journal of Neuroscience, Vision Research, and others. So although there is much more to say, I will stop here and welcome you, Conchetta, to our seminar. Thank you for joining us to share with you with us your research. Thanks, Sharon. You, uh, you know, thanks very much for very much for this uh, very detailed introduction, and thank you to organize this uh, seminar series. I think they are really nice. I followed many, and thanks a lot. It's very important for the community. So today, um, I will talk about a few. Uh, a different line that just we opened a few years ago here in PISA lab, and it's really about prediction and neural oscillation in perception. And when you talk about the prediction, of course you, uh -oh. of course you cannot not start by the Cambridge Visual School. Remember Richard uh, Richard Gregory and. Uh, Horace Barlow, Richard Gregory, because he was saying that, that our perception of the world are hypotheses based on the past experience and store information. Perception is a constructive process that rely on top-down processing. 
a Horus that we, Horus Barlow that just we lost a few, two years ago, three years ago. And another, we came more from physiology, more from the information theory, but he also had a clear uh, idea that prediction are important and prediction are possible only if there is a very a lot of redundancy in in the incoming of information but to 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 trace that uh, prediction signal you have to demonstrate that that uh, redundancy is not just noise really the redundancy that there is a temporal characteristics that uh, is a constant trend in one evolution so uh, clearly uh, go and look for the prediction signal is not to be easy although i think still now we believe that we i mean at least uh, i do agree with uh, richard the horas stating that much of our vision is not just bottom up, but is based, is generative in some way. We would say with the modern terminology is a generative perception. So uh, in this paper, in this uh, seminar, I would like to concentrate mainly on the link on the possible function of neural uh, oscillation in carrying some prediction signal. And I hope that I can demonstrate some of this idea. So now the literature about uh, endogenous oscillation is really blooming in the recent year has been a very important and very important field of uh, research. And, uh, you know, oscillation is really one of the building block of our uh, neuron. Every time that you have uh, temporal dynamics, uh, in the end, every, all circuits have started to oscillate. So it's really one peculiar characteristic of the nervous system. However, this oscillation that are very chaotic can be what in technically said phase reset when a signal could be a sound, could be another external event, could be an action, could be a visual event, could be a decision. And this uh, signal, so both internal and external, can reset the phase of this oscillation. And at that point, that phasing resetting is generating oscillatory rhythm in phase, like what has been demonstrated here. Now, this from the electrophysiological point of view, what recently we have, we know, mainly from the early work of Varulen, of Landau and Fries, in the Tirtino, of the Sabina Kastner laboratory, Fibel, Korn, and so many, we show, uh, I mean, all this literature told that those oscillations really go and modulate behavior. So you have also perceptual threshold, the perceptual decision that do oscillate, and you can, uh, can record those oscillation behaviorally uh, if you have a, a phase resetting signal. And recently we show that indeed also the planning of an action act like a phase reset of endogenous relations. Let me just summarize few of those, uh, uh, okay, this is the literature. Uh, let me summarize two aspects of this. So uh, later I can go on with the new data and the idea, but I have to change my screen, otherwise I cannot, okay. So we know, so we demonstrated with a series of experiments, and briefly I will refer to some, I will show some, that indeed going in the face of the ongoing oscillation can be synchronized by the intention to perform an action. And this has a direct consequence on low level vision and also on auditory processing. And it's a modulation that happens very early, already in primary visual cortex, at least for vision. And the role of this oscillation are not clear, but one thing that we observed in some paper and we, is that they can be useful somehow in compensating or to align 
the temporal, the temporal process of sensation of sensory cortex with the temporal process of the motor action. So now compensating perhaps also some of the uh, inherent delay in the, both in the motor and the sensory uh, processing. Here in this seminar, I would concentrate mainly on a new part and uh, some are really new data on face classification and transaccadic vision. And this new part, I hope that I can demonstrate to you that indeed uh, some of this oscillation carry also the uh, temporal contextual effect, carry information about the prior or what we call also serial dependence. But let me go and start to demonstrate the first some oscillation. So all this story in our lab started with uh, uh, Alice Tomasini at the time a PhD student. And we were doing a totally different experiment. We want to really measure the you know, the temporal binding between vision and action. The experiment consisted to fixate a random dynamic noise. At a certain point, there was a patch. I don't know if you saw the patch. I can, I can play again the movie. So here appeared the patch, again, oriented the grating. The subject had to report the orientation of the grating. But at a certain point, the subject had to also do a reaching movement in close loop, so you could not see his end. And we started to measure threshold synchronized with the onset of action. And what we found on the individual subject, we found very strong oscillation that in orientation discrimination, so in performance, in sensitivity, and this oscillation were on the theta range, and this oscillation, these are two individual subjects, are synchronized with the onset of the action. We were quite surprised, so we set up with a lot of data. We measured the uh, contrast, the psychometric function varying the contrast of the grating. Indeed, we found that the sensitivity uh, was oscillating, somehow implicating the action of primary visual cortex and not a later decision stage. So to, we pursue this uh, uh, experiment further, we simplified and we uh, made the action very simple. The action was just a push a button. So the subject is there. When he wants, he push a button. At some delay after the push of button, and this gray tick is appearing and he gray. And the subject had to report if the, uh, low, the special frequency was higher in the upper or in the lower part, to, so to alternative for choice discrimination. And uh, the delay between the action onset and the stimulus could be a random any time between uh, zero and 600 milliseconds. This is uh, the psychophysical performance measured outside, uh, you know, normally in the same subject that later on we went and measured in the scanner. And you see that there is again a theta oscillation and a very highly significant and, and so on. Of course, each of these data points is a lot, a lot of data. So we thought that at this point, we could go in the scanner and test if indeed this oscillation had origin at the level of uh, primary initial cortex. So we recorded in our 70, the, the, to measure the oscillation, you need a very brief stimuli. In this case, it's 33 milliseconds. To get a bold response from a very such short stimuli, a very reliable bold response, is difficult. That is the reason why you need to go very high, uh, high field uh, MRI. So we went on the 70 scanner and we presented this for SOE. So the stimuli had these four particular SOE, 70, 150, 230, and 300 something. And you see that the bold activity followed oscillation quite well. And this is the bold activity of a primary initial cortex, of all primary initial cortex. So we believe this is 
a demonstration that indeed this synchronized oscillation, if it's a synchronized oscillation that is generating this increase in sensitivity, do take place in V1. But this is related to the action. So what this, uh, how this is possible? Well, uh, Alice Tomasini, that was for a period in Donders, also read, uh, recorded the EG and asked if the theta, uh, the theta rhythm in the premotor motor cortex could predict the variation in sensitivity of visual stimuli. And indeed she could, and even 1.5 seconds before that subject had started action. So it's like a synchronized rhythm that happens before. And what we believe, what also we found in our fMRI data is that depending on the delay of the stimulus, also the connectivity, functional connectivity between V1 and M1 go and is modulated in time. So like if there is a master clock, can we say, or a master signal that synchronizes the two cortex and when they are perfect in phase, of course, connectivity is higher and, predict, and you can have a prediction of the outcome. So this is already all published work and uh, also some recent. And, uh, you know, fine, you said, well, why, why we should, you know, uh, why should be the oscillation? Perhaps we can discuss it later on. But really, we wanted to know are those oscillation carrying also information about about your recent perceptual histories about priors? And indeed, we had uh, we had some preliminary data that would indicate so. And they came from a totally different experiment that we ran in Sydney with Dave Dallet that used sound. So in that case, we had a reset, as a reset of the endogenous oscillation. We use a acoustic noise uncorrelated between the two years. And then sadly at any time after the noise onset, a target would appear. And the target is just a brief, uh, uh, a brief sound that could uh, happen in the left or in the right ear. And the subject had just to report left to right, left to right. Very simple stuff. Well, to use the result of this initial data sure, were quite interesting because we did find oscillation. And we found oscillation of four criteria now. So criteria oscillation that oscillate a much higher frequency. So it's not any more theta, but it's in the alpha range. But those oscillation were present only if you presented twice in a row the stimulus in the same year. So only for target, uh, the, uh, the present target and the uh, the couples you want of target that were presented in the left in the left ear or in the right in the right ear. Those produced oscillation that were significant, while the couple of stimuli that before was in the left, after on the right, or before in the right, and later in the left, so the did not produce reliable oscillation. Could be some, but clearly. To measure, I don't know, you need much, much, much more data probably, but clearly we had no indication of modulation. So somehow that memory of the prior may be present, but it's not always active. Perhaps it's active only when you need, but how this can be explained? Well, to explain this kind of result, we are thinking in terms of perceptual echo, concepts that were uh, introduced by Varulen many years ago and also Popel Labs. And the idea is that you do have an echo of what is being your last sensory experience. 
this echo is intermingled with this random endogenous relation. When the phase reset signal comes, also this trace gets phase reset, but is always surviving in the channel that where the visual or the auditory stimulus was uh, produced an excitation. So in this case, this signal phase reset, the target is arriving and it's eating this memory trace. So you'll see a behavioral effect. If it's in the other channel, you don't see the behavioral effect. So it's somehow a signal that tells you uh, that, that information perhaps is stable, that, is, that information is useful. That is the general idea that we have. So we said, well, that is fine. These are all simple detection, so probably mediated by primary visual cortex. So let's go and see where prediction is much more important or have a stronger modulation, like for higher cognitive vision. And we didn't go very high in cognition. We just stopped it to face perception. And also we decided to use another way to analyze the data in a way that uh, is related to this paper that both came in uh, 2014, one from uh, David Whitney, uh, Jason Fisher in National Neuroscience, another one from uh, our laboratory of David with Marco and Giovanni. And both, uh, in this case, they study David uh, Whitney study orientation, uh, David study more complex uh, vision, that is perception of numerosity, but both came with the idea that in perception, you need a continuity between your past and your present. And that continuity may be also useful uh, for some reason that I don't have time to, to go in detail, but it's a way to reduce overall noise. And what is happening is that uh, the new evidence somehow is a weighted sum of your past evidence with the new evidence. So the new is never total new. It's always weighted with what was your previous processing, your previous decision. They call this mechanism serial dependence. And let me so show a slide from uh, uh, David Whitney. This is his paper in National Neuroscience. If you give a tilted oriented stimulus before, and then you another stimulus oriented is slightly different. If this orientation is exactly the same, of course, you don't have no bias in your perception because if both are oriented at zero, you'll see zero. But if the preceding stimulus was oriented slanted a bit more, your present stimulus will be dragged towards that orientation. So there is a, a, an attraction towards the previous stimulus orientation, both towards the left and the, and the right. So there is an attraction of the past memory with the present stimulus. Works very well for orientation, works very well for faces. And this again is an experiment for Whitney. And, uh, uh, and we thought that it would have been a good idea to go a measure phase where these serial effects are stronger. So let uh, see, let me report first our, our data. A previous male or female stimulus bias perception of androgenous stimulus. So we define a set of stimuli are of synthetic phase. This is done with Jason Bell in uh, Perth. They, have a, they are specialists of phase perception. And uh, so we define a set of stimulus, some that look really male, some that look really female, and some that are androgenous. So we measure the psychometric function. We use a 25% female phase, 25% male phase, and 50% of uh, androgenous phase. The subject was a fixating. Then he started the trial, and this is the reset signal. He started the trial by pushing the finger, 
Stimulus appearing at randomly any time between one uh, zero and one second, and the stimulus is very brief. When you analyze all this data together without looking at the, the dynamic of the stimulus presentation, you really see a very strong, strong effect of serial dependence. If before there was a mail that you have higher probability to report a mail. So you bias your perception towards a mail. If before was a female, you bias your perception towards a female. And the effect works also for two trial specs. So clearly it's an accumulation over time. Well, fine. What happens when we do the same, uh, you know, we measure bias as function of the stimulus delay presentation respect to the action onset. And this is the, the major result. Zero is the push button. There are oscillation. They are very complex here. Each point is experimental. The red curve is the fit. When we analyze the, the experimental point, we see two peaks. Now it's quite high frequency, it's a lower beta, it's around 14, 18 hertz. And surprisingly, when we split this data set in the trial in which before was a male, or in the trial in which before was a female, we found these two different, but do you see my, no, you, you should not, do you see my, um, it's called the um, zoom Your point. yes no. yes we do we uh, can i put it down that zoom so that's... okay sorry sorry about you should have told me i thought that you will not see it. yeah we, we're seeing the screen i think i mean we're seeing <laughs> <Sorry. the point. laughs> anyway so when i split this uh data set in two when the trial preceded by mail in the trial preceded by female, these two oscillations really separate. Now the trial preceded them by male, they have only one peak at 17 hertz. The trial preceded by female have only one peak at 14 hertz. So like if this prior information use is carried depending on the feature of the stimulus at a different frequency. Why should be so? We still, we don't know. But clearly, it's getting more powerful. I mean, the, both the encoding and probably the decoding of this story information, given that are, are separate in frequency. So at this point, we want really to know, well, if the result seems so clear and also so, you know, so clear, but also so surprising to us, we decided that we first we needed to repeat the experiment. Second, we need also to try to understand by EG where this signal could really act and what is the dynamic or try to understand better. So this is done work that Giacomo is doing in, uh, in our lab. Giacomo is a PhD student. First, he replicated the experiment and instead to face a reset by an action. In this case, he just gave a beep because we didn't want to mess too much with our EEG signal. Then the face is appearing, a very similar face, just slightly different, and is going to measure the response. So what is the result that he got psychophysically? These are the, pre the response when the previous response, the previous stimulus was a male. This when the previous stimulus was a female. Well, when it's a male, again, these are 14 new subjects run in PISA, not, so not Australia. Again, we have an 18 hertz oscillation. When is the previous response a female, the peak is not very clear, probably splitting in half but still is around the 14, 16 hertz. So we replicated the previous published data. Well, what about EEG? Well, we, first of all, he went and see if any evidence between the previous uh, res response female, a previous response male, 
uh, could be evident in the ERP when synchronized to the audio cue or when synchronized to the face stimulus sensor. And really, well, you can see, look, the face are in red, the female face are in red, the previous female face in red, in blue, the previous male face. Perhaps there is something, but it's not highly convincing in the overall ERP and in all the subjects. So he took a more stronger and uh, powerful approach that is uh, decoding and classification. So the method here gets very com more complex. So the, the people, the students that would like to see the method, this method we already applied in a recent publication in Journal Neuroscience. But here what, uh, uh, what uh, Giacomo did, oh, I need to eliminate this somehow. Ah. Anyway. I had to share just the PowerPoint and not all of my screen, sorry about that. <laughs> so it did a support vector machine classification. Zero is the time in which the stimulus is appearing, the current stimulus is appearing. Any time after the appearance, even before of the current stimulus, it trained the model that was able to detect or accurately report the uh, male or female of the previous stimulus. So is this possible? The first question is, if I use the EEG signal, associated to the current presentation of the face. Can I decode the history, so the previous face information, if male or female? The answer is yes, you can. And when we apply the, uh, the current model, oh, what is happening? When we apply the current model at all this interval to testing the previous response, you see that there is a significant, the significant decoding around 400 milliseconds and around after one second. This is the coding for female, male, using only the androgynous signal. Well, this signal was in the low beta, 14, 20 hertz because we knew that if this signal was present, it would be better, stronger in that frequency. But the most important interesting data is that when we go and get all the average accuracy in all this time window uh, of the EG signal and correlate that average decoding after time T0 with the psychophysical performance, overall psychophysical performance of this attractive effect of serial dependence across in the, each individual subject, we have a quite good correlation. So there is a correlation of the EEG signal, of the information contained in the EEG signal about your past uh, experience, and the effect of serial dependence that the subject uh, is uh, uh, that the subject is reporting or, or that we measure on the individual subject. So do we Did have this at the low beta? What is happening at other frequency? If there are any questions, please interrupt me. I hear some noise. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, sorry. I wanted to ask, um, which uh, did you look at? Um, are these across the whole brain or just several, let's say, uh, posterior electrodes? No, 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 no. That uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I didn't say. We really look at the classification across all the electrodes. So really, the question here: looking all the electrodes, do mm -hmm. we change a shift of activity across the electrode? when we go and trace back the, the predictive signal, if you want to go. Okay. Back. Yeah. Thank you. So it's not like, um, uh, you know, fMRI decoding. So 
But uh, here we also try to see that indeed is relevant this slide in which we report the activation map of the previous response decoding. And what we found quite interesting is that even at zero, so before that the visual stimulus is really is able to activate visual cortex, and given that it takes 50, 60, 70 milliseconds to reach the V1, you have a, a good, you have some trend that this occipital parietal cord, uh, electrode do have a trace of the previous stimulus. Red means that they are more active when there is a, there is more power when Conchetta, the was female. I, yes? I am not sure we are seeing the slide that you're referring to. Maybe I'm, 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 I'm mistaken, but we are currently seeing the slide with the title classification with SVM, training current response and testing previous response. Sorry, go back. Do you see this slide? We see, well, I see the slide with the, still the slide with the, um, with the title of classification with SVM. Yes. I don't know if and what now others... do you, And now do you see the activation map? I, I don't. Oh, sorry. Um, Anybody else see the activation map? Anyway, I can easily summarize. You have just an early very early activity in the front, in the uh, occipital parietal. This activity moves around the 400, 200 millisecond more in the frontal decision. And it's not activity. I mean, it's the power of the signal more useful to classify the history. And then around the 400, 500 millisecond moves back to the, uh, again, to the occipital cortex. But uh, let's also look when we use, do you see this slide now? Conchetta, if it's not advancing, maybe you should uh, yeah, we share. crash out and restart your... Um... Okay, let me start. Yeah. So shall I in the room, shall I uh, break? And, you, uh... you can uh, stop the sharing and start share again. Maybe that will also work. Yeah, okay. So let me start again the PowerPoint. So I will... Oh, oh, sorry. No, God, what I did. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay, so let me close this. Okay. So we repeated this analysis, changing the band to, to feed the, uh, the, support, the support vector machine models. So we use the both, uh, you know, theta, alpha, and beta band. And what you see, this is the coding accuracy for perceiving the previous, uh, you know, for decoding the previous male phase decoding the previous female phases, I should say response more than phase. And you see there is not really much variation with the frequency band. And the sum of the two is the dashed uh, line. And as you see, it's quite, uh, you know, it's pretty much constant. However, when we go look at how it's changing the, um, the correlation of that decoding accuracy across the subject as a function of the frequency band, we found a very excellent correlation, I would say log bias factor of nearly three for female around 16, 15 Hertz and for male around 18 Hertz. So somehow the stronger correlation took place exactly at the frequency where we observed this, uh, this uh, rhythmic oscillation. So we believe that there is uh, uh, the trace of that rhythmic information is in this, uh, is present in the EG, is present more in the overall network of DG, more than just one specific location is the question I was asking. But the correlation is very good. So 
uh, keep in mind that this is a test or a test experiment. So probably we should give some weight to the idea that independent prior are synchronized at independent frequency. Okay. So just to summarize what just I said, we probably already summarized. The important part is that, uh, uh, that there is a, a good correlation between the psychophysical behavior measurement and the DHG. Okay. At this point, we said, well, let's go even more complex to try to see the, this prior. And um, more complex, let's use a, a case, a, you know, a situation where we are particularly, where, where the signal uh, uh, can strongly modulate by our past vision. And that is during presarcadic vision or perisarcadic vision. In fact, uh, you know, during the onset of a saccade, the vision is particularly fragile. It's a moment of maximum uncertainty. And indeed, uh, you know, uh, this prior signal can be measured better. So uh, what time, uh, how long do I have, uh, Sharon? Uh, um, well, usually it's like um, until um, the end, it's about, there's about 18 minutes, but you can stop before, but okay. it's best no, not so, before. Okay, so let me just go and do what happens. I will, I will, uh, I will skip some slide that are anyway published work, so you should know. So, so we try to replicate this prior uh, dependence of uh, visual sensitivity perisarcadically. So the subject had to fixate at this point. A saccadic target is coming. And I hope that it's coming. Oh, God. The movie? Okay, it's coming. Sorry. So your subject is fixating. A stimulus, a prior stimulus is happening. Then a saccadic target is coming. Then a test stimulus is coming. And the subject had to adjust. So just to report the orientation of the test stimulus. Now, the test and the prior stimuli are identical, and they both can have a change of orientation, it could be 35, 45, 55 degree, or minus 35, minus 45, minus 55. And the prior, the test is, uh, <coughs> the, the prior and test difference was always O plus 15, O minus 15, O 90. So the prior could be useful for serial dependence. Indeed, uh, test at 15 or minus 15 from the prior, who should be attracted by the prior orientation. The one in 90 degree should not. So let's see the, first of all, uh, the overall uh, average, you know, the serial dependence is function of saccades. This is an experiment done by CEO that was a postdoc in our lab, and now she's back in, uh, um, in China. And, um, and what she found, she, let's see just the summary slide. She found that perisarcadically, your attraction towards the previous orientation stimulus, the previous stimulus orientation was much stronger than very far from the saccade. For 90 degrees, so when test and prior were orthogonal, there is no much attraction at all. So indeed, the serial dependence is stronger in the moment in which a vision is more fragile or more uncertain. Well, let's analyze the same data as a function of oscillation. And again, also in this case, we found that when the trial the add where, where the trial and the prior were uh, of the same orientation, so just plus or minus 15 degree apart, we observed 
a reliable oscillation, and here is the spectra, and these are, you know, uh, the corrected threshold is uh, here. So a significant oscillation for congruent, but again, for incongruent trial, there is no significant oscillation. So we are replicating somehow what we observed during the, the auditor experiment. Like again, if the prior is useful for the actual vision now, because you want also to con collect, to continue vision from pre saccadic to post saccadic So when that information orientation is something that is useful for your, your post saccadic vision, you have uh, uh, a signal that oscillates in synchrony with the saccadic concept. So, Again, why should be this oscillation? What is uh, the, where this is signal here? And these are really very preliminary data, but I decided to show, these are data done by Chiara, again, another PhD student in our laboratory, and where she's recording EEG while making uh, the same, making saccades and presenting only the test stimulus. So we eliminated the prior, so DG signal, it's more easy to understand. So the subject is doing the saccade, the, the stimulus is coming, or after the saccade, or before the saccade, and the subject had to report the orientation. What we found? Well, DG signal is a very, very, is strongly synchronized. This is only one subject, but was verified in all the subjects tested. Zero is the start of the saccade. You have a very strong alpha signal before the onset of saccade is synchronized with saccadic onset. This is no new. Uh, David Melcher and others reported this uh, strong alpha oscillation. However, this strong alpha oscillation is inside this alpha oscillation also at the memory trace of the previous trial. So what Chiara did, uh, first of all, she did a, a, an analysis that is important to do for the post saccadic trial, because in that case, you have a strong uh, artifact. Let, it's not an artifact, it's a proper signal related to the eye movement and is present all the time, but it's really difficult to analyze the EEG signal. So what Chiara did, she took the EEG signal after that the stimulus were presented only pre and took the difference between the congruent and the incongruent orientation between the current and previous, a previous trial. And this is for one electrode, I don't see the electrode, I think it's PZ, yes. And the other one is for the occipital electrode. And clearly you can see that there is an alpha rhythm that is stronger for the congruent trial than for the incongruent trial, around 10 Hz. This is for the Z, again, there is alpha, perhaps also theta, and this is stronger for 10 Hz. But is this a signal, I mean, this is signal after the saccade. Somehow it would be more important to see if the same effect is before the saccade. And here she attempted even a more difficult effect. She went and analyzed single trial VEG. And what she did was the difference in the alpha power electrode by electrode, when the subject reported the serial dependence, this was a stimulus presented before the saccade. So, the, uh, sorry, the stimulus was uh, presented after the saccade. She analyzed the, the EG signal before the saccade. And by ranking, when that EG signal was associated to a future response of the subject towards attraction, or when it's associated to a future response against uh, uh, repulsion, so not subject to, to serial dependence. So the idea is, the question here is, is this alpha pre-saccadic power 
predictive of the future outcome of the subject? And the answer is yes. All the deep, the, the, the thick points are significant and more alpha power when the subject is perceiving an attraction in the future stimulus. And these are uh, significant corrected for multiple Bonferroni uh, correction. So I showed you the signal in all this region. This is the power that uh, the difference. So here is the more signal, more power in the uh, attractive response. And again, as you can see, the peak is around 10 hertz. So just to summarize this part and also to conclude the talk, we believe that there are explicit memory signal in the EG, and this explicit memory signal gets phase reset, gets synchronized with the onset of the saccades in the previous experiment with the, the audio signal. And uh, uh, those oscillations are very similar in behavior and in the EG signal. And the pre-stimulus alpha power somehow predicts the future outcome response of the subject that is really a perceptual response. It's just a reproduction of orientation. So we can say that uh, this signal operates probably already at a quite uh, early stage of analysis because we see a lot of activity in the posterior. Uh, this alpha power, I did, sorry, I did not uh, show highlight before, but this electrode positioned in the posterior uh, occipital cortex. So somehow this memory probably is present there from very, probably from the very, uh, it's, it's encoded there very, very early. It's a soul that the trial is finished. So in conclusion of what uh, I would like to convey to you is that uh, synchronization of oscillation will be really general brain mechanism. And probably is, uh, is uh, very general and uh, probably we have to give a particular attention to the frequency because frequency may be a useful strategy to decoding later the information. The oscillation is the same for, it's different, uh, are observed both for change in bias and change in sensitivity. And for the change in bias, there are uh, this information, this oscillation also carry prior information. And uh, serial dependent uh, uh, signal, serial dependent signal can be the coding in DG in the same band where we saw the oscillation of serial dependence. And uh, this EG uh, signal in the occipital location are predictive of the future outcome or the future response of the individual subject in the trial by trial uh, analysis. So, we should ask, uh, what is the benefit of an oscillatory memory trace? Why, why the memory sh should oscillate? Why, uh, or if we talk about generative perception, why we should have a, an advantage to have a prior, an oscillation of the prior? I mean, what could be the use? Well, one very reductive well, it could be just to say is that the oscillation uh, may, go, may be good to align and to bind this, uh, you know, the actual processing of the stimulus with all the rest of the brain. If you, these two are oscillated, you can predict, perhaps you can also find a way to eliminate the delay is, uh, between the various analysis that are very variable and very, you know, they are not predetermined usually. But there is also another idea that uh, given that oscillation is really are so common in the brain, perhaps uh, 
we have to think more in the recursive nature of generative vision. This is something that Friston likes a lot. He published a lot on this. He always think that the loop is that you do prediction, but then you have to verify if the re, uh, actual, you know, the, the actual stimulus or the analysis, the process of the actual stimulus match your prediction. And this usually requires a top-down, bottom-up bottom loop. The information has to travel in a different part of the brain. And, you know, depends perhaps how far are this part of the brain. You have one oscillation. If it's close, you have another oscillation. We don't know. Clearly, are open questions that we don't know but uh, we found a very interesting question. So let me just thank all the people. I wanted to show Alicia. She started all the celebrity research in our laboratory. Alicia Tomasini, and then Alessandro and Paola, they did all the simulation and fMRI and the simulation synchronized with action. Tamo for the auditory analysis, David, and uh, all the vision lab for uh, this support and the continuous joy in collaborating with them. And of course, our the senior collaborator beside David, Giulio Sandini for the initial work and David Alle for the auditory work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Conchetta, for a wonderful and very exciting talk. So I'd like to um, invite everybody to unmute your um, speakers and let's give a big uh, applaud. Un secondo, un attimo, un attimo. Um, are you happy with um, uh, taking questions? Sure, sure. Okay, lovely. So um, I would just to like to see my window larger. So I can, I, I, do you know how to do? To do oh, what? I can see all the people. Um, okay, Jeremy says he needs to go and thanks. Um, you have on Zoom uh, view options. So on your right, top right um, corner, you may have an icon where you can choose how to, uh, which settings you may be using. Do you see that? No, but that's a matter, okay. No, doesn't matter. Do okay. you see me anyway? Yeah. Yeah. Every. I mean. I think. Yeah. <laughs> um. So. Um. Uri, do you yeah. have a question? Yeah. Uh, Conchetta, I, I maybe you said it, but I didn't really. I, it looks that the oscillation is in the slow waves, like what? It's alpha or lower than alpha? No. 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 Wait. Um. The oscillation in the, in uh, sensitivity uh, and also the paper of uh, Pascal Fries and many other and uh, Sabina is always in the theta range. And then to talk about uh, sensitivity. So four, five, six, seven hertz. As soon as you go and analyze a criterion of bias, those frequency gets higher, go between eight hertz up to 20. Depends on the uh, depends really on the particular condition that you study. For saccade, we found the tenors in both set of uh, experiments. Okay. But for phase, we found the 18 hertz. So why they should change? I have no idea. I mean, for auditory, again, we found the tenors. Could be the, my feeling, but I could be totally wrong. Uh, maybe due to the complexity, not of the task, but of the stimulus. But I could be wrong. I cannot hear you, Shara. You're correct. <laughs> I was muted. So I have a question. I wanted to ask if you think that all these, um, um, let's say, resetting phase signals have to do with the somatis, uh, with the sensory motor system. And so while you are, let's say, thinking, um, then you have all the um, um, motor and sensory cortices go out of phase. 
and do you need some sensory or motor event to to put them back in phase do you understand what i'm yeah. asking that is my my intuition my intuition i mean one thing is sure i did not stress today the oscillation happens during the programming phase even during the program phase v1 and motor they are in phase okay so who is doing this we don't know so it's during the programming phase now mm -hmm. in the in thy movement literature, there is always something that bothers us. You have a maximum, for example, you have maximum suppression always at saccadic onset. Okay. But the stimulus will re arrive in the cortex 70 milliseconds later. The stimulus that you are suppressing. So mm -hmm. clearly, the motor have to anticipate somehow as to keep that delay in this activity and maybe oscillation can do that that is what is, but to demonstrate is quite difficult of course so i think you are right uh, one mechanism could be to keep in pace at that delay exactly the the activity motor in the visual cortex so I have another, so do you think a saccade by itself um, resets the phase? Yeah, the saccade by itself, without doing, I think so. Um, okay. Indeed, uh, uh, yeah, I think so. Micro saccade, I don't know, but saccade itself, yes. Because saccade is always associated also to a shift of attention, you know, I mean. Yeah, and it's also a motor, a motor really, huh? response. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm also thinking, I'm just hand waiting, but I was thinking that maybe this, in a way, I mean, when you're thinking, maybe your eyes move in a bit of a different way. And so maybe this uh, allows um, the... To synchronize your thoughts. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's maybe that's when you get the DNA, uh, the default mode network to actually synchronize and... I don't know, just hand-waving completely. Yeah. yeah. But Other you know, there is a lot of pathology. I mean, I like this field also because clearly there is a word that I learned very recently that is called oscillopathy because they say that in many clinical, like in early degeneration syndrome, could be Alzheimer, but also Parkinson. But Parkinson, you could understand. One of the first symptoms is loss of oscillation in the hippocampus. Okay. Mm. Oscillation in the hippocampus. So, and these are early symptoms. Yeah. Yeah, I did not know that. Um, no, I didn't that? know. I just discovered the recent yeah. Hi, oh, hi. Uh, that was a great talk. It's a lot of information, so I'm trying to digest. But in the last um, study, I got a little bit lost with how you were using the attraction and the repulsion. And I wonder if, if you could just help me understand. So you had the reference, and then you had plus or minus 15, but then you had a very orthogonal stimulus. Sometimes could be orthogonal, sometimes could be intermingled. Yeah. Okay, and the attraction and repulsion, are you referring to just what you flash first and then during or after the saccade? No, no, the, I'm for, sorry, I didn't, uh, I didn't explain well. The attraction is the perceptual report of the test stimulus if it's attracted towards what you saw before, okay? Okay. So if you have a, a test at orientation uh, 35, the, the stimulus before was at orientation uh, uh, 45. Mm -hmm. okay? What uh, usually happens is the subject is uh, uh, reproduce an orientation that is between 40, 42 towards the previous stimulus. And that for me is an attraction. Okay, so you're saying the previous one within that trial, not the or or the n minus one. That's what I, it's not clear to me. No, no, it's the minus one. Oh, the know, n minus one. Okay. Actual, okay, it's the signal, the EG signal of the actual trial. Okay. Yeah. 
So the one I'm doing is arcade, so it's that EEG signal. Mm -hmm. So Chiara put the EEG signal is associated with the, an attraction towards the one back trial. Yes, she put call attraction. Is associated with the repulsion. Yes, she put in the bin repulsion, and then she does the difference. Okay, and that the is assumption the is that the repulsion means that that in that moment for that trial the subject did not have much serial dependence because the serial dependence is always an attraction. Okay, and that's independent on when the stimulus came during the saccade, or that's only when it landed. He said she did only for the stimulus after when the stimulus came after the saccade. After, okay. so it's predictive. Okay, the question is: Is the stimulus before the saccade already tells you something of what will be your outcome? If there is a, a bigger alpha power. Mm -hmm. you will be more subject to serial dependence. If there is no much alpha power, you are free of the past. Okay, thanks. That is the, how we interpret it. Thank you. Um, Conchetta, so I said that Jeremy said he needs to go and thanks, and Eileen uh, Cowler also wrote thanks, great work. Um, yeah, I don't there... Exactly. It's from the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is, is are there um any additional questions? So I myself have another question I wanted to ask because um you're talking about a memory trace, but it's a very short uh, lived memory trace. So do you think this is kind of like sensory? Or would you say visual short term it's memory? No, very short indeed. Um... Oh, my, the name, uh, I mean, you know her very well because she works in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, Mira Ayelet? Ayelet Landau? No, Mirav. Ah, Mirav. Mirav. Yeah, Mirav Gisa. Uh -huh. She uh, measured serial dependence. She found, if I remember well, 30 seconds. So really you could accumulate over time, if I remember. I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, because I thought just I... that it gets weaker and weaker with his two trial back, three trial back, and uh, she thinks that there is also temporary limits. Yeah. I okay. see. Yeah. So thank you very much for this um, uh, great and exciting talk. And if there are no more questions, um, we'll um, give another applaud and. Thank you for joining us and we will be here um, next week, same time. Um, actually, maybe for the people in the East Coast, it may be a different time. We have to, I, I'll publish that because of the changes in uh, summer daylight savings. So more or less the same time for everybody else. So it's three o'clock for us. Probably. Yeah, for you it's uh, yes, <laughs> same time. Okay, thank you very, very much. much. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Have a lovely week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao, Marisa. Thank you. Ciao, Conchata. Ciao, Conchata.